Up now, we have Alex and Konark with anonymous rate limiting with direct anonymous attestation. Thank you and welcome everybody to our talk. Uh, my name is Konark and this is Alex. And we both work for a company called Clicks based out of Munich, Germany. For those of you who have not heard about Clicks, we are basically a privacy friendly search engine which can be accessed through our browser and through our Firefox add on. And apart from being a search engine, we also package the browser and an add on uh, among various, uh, with various privacy features like anti tracking, ad blocking. And uh, we're also the parent company for CoStrade. Today, we're going to talk about a system that we built and develop, that we developed and use at Clicks, which basically helps us prevent attacks on our data collection system. Although the examples that we will take here uh, will be based on based on the events that we receive in our data streams, but we believe uh, the system is generic enough that wherever rate limiting applies, the system can be used. Before Alex will uh, talk about the system in detail, I would just like to explain why at first place we needed to build an anonymous rate limiting system and how it has evolved since 2016. Now, it's important to understand that data is important to build services, and Clicks is no exception. To power our search engine, anti-tracking, anti-phishing, data is of the most importance. And yes, it might sound a bit controversial talking about data collection at a privacy village, but it's important to understand that when you talk about data and privacy, how that data is being collected is of the uttermost importance. If you look at this table here, uh, this is what any, most of the data streams in the industry will look like. Most of the data collection happens with an identifier that is sent back home with the events. It, the identifier could be a long-term identifier, an explicit identifier like a cookie, which you see on the extreme right, or it could be based on, it could be an implicit identifier based on multiple parameters like IP and the user agent. The whole, the whole notion of sending back identifier is so that use cases like analytics could be solved on the back end. So for example, based on this data stream, we can easily solve the question, how many unique visitors visited facebook.com in a given hour, right? But also because of the presence of the identifier, you can link multiple events on the back end, which means not only can you solve the use case of finding out unique visits on Facebook, you can also see that the same user also visited booking.com, Twitter dashboard, and maybe because of some capability URLs, you can potentially de-anonymize the user itself, right? So, at, so when we started to design our data collection streams, we wanted to ensure that any data point that can link multiple messages on the back end needs to be dropped on the client side itself. What that means is in our data streams, there is no way you can link multiple messages together. That could be implicitly or explicitly. And in order for us to even prevent ourselves from linking messages based on network fingerprinting, we also want to route the data through a set of proxies. So that means the data collection streams are clean and cannot be linked with multiple events. That said, we still can solve the use cases that the uh, that is needed uh, by that is needed to collect identifiers for but for this purpose for this talk we will not dig deeper into how we do it if you want more details we can talk offline or you can read this paper and our approach how we do uh, data collection anonymously and yet solve the use cases coming back to the motivation of doing this talk now the problem is uh, all the data collection systems suffer from the same problem that an uh, attacker can spam you with multiple messages which are fake, which are not actually happening on the user's machine, right? And we are no exception. But because our, so if you take, let's take an example here. So for example, one of the most important data points for us is query logs. What that means is uh, what is the query that user did and what result did the user select from our search results, right? And this query log powers uh, how we rank our search engine and how we promote the content because that detects what's the pop popularity of a query and a landing page, right? Now, an attacker, knowing that we do not have uh, identifiers in our data streams, can spam us with multiple messages, right? And once the spammer starts to send us multiple messages, it could be used for altering or promoting their own content at a different rank, or maybe disrupt our services by promoting a bad result for a good query. Right? To give you a more concrete example, just based on these two messages, these are two sample query logs, query booking, the landing page booking.com, query booking, the landing page booking holidays.com. Just based on the message content, we cannot detect whether it's a fabricated data or a genuine data, right? 
and because unlike other search engines we do not track users there is no way we can know what is the source of the message and what is the history of the source itself to use it for server side rate limiting or um, for server side rate limiting solutions right and this is a big big concern for us because now at one point we are doing anonymous data collection but because it's anonymous it can negatively impact our services itself right so one solution could be let's stop anonymous data collection and let's start tracking users but that is not what we want to do so we want to build a service wherein we can detect without de-anonymizing the user uh, whether it's the same user sending us multiple messages or these are different users you can think about this as a voting system where a trusted user can vote but can only vote once for a given period right now think about this problem as the user needs to vote for popularity of a query but can only vote once in a given time frame in a mode called in the context of this query log we only want to receive one query per user one normalized query per user in one hour right and if we talk about a general implementation of the system based on the message type and the content of the message we want to rate limit the users rate limit per user per time frame right and that's kind of important for us and that's why the problem that we try to solve is without knowing the user how do we enforce these rate limiting users or this these rate limiting rules right so in 2016 uh, we pushed a version to production which we call anonymous rate limiting version 1 and the idea was because we are already using proxies to transport data we can actually uh, empower the proxies without learning the content of the message but still perform deduplication for us but what that meant was these proxies needed to run custom software which performed these deduplication tasks now it, this protocol was based on blind signatures and other standard crypto primitives but yet for this solution to work we needed multiple trusted third party providers to run proxies for us the reason we needed multiple third party proxy providers first was because they needed to run the custom application and second we did not want that the users could collide with the proxies or the proxies could collide among themselves or clicks in clicks itself could collude among the proxies right but what happened was we tried finding these multiple third party vendors to run proxies for us and sadly in about 2 years we could not find any right what that meant was clicks had to run their own proxies which kind of defeated the whole purpose and because these proxies had to run a custom software to perform deduplication we cannot rely on the off shelf solutions like tor or other uh, trusted vendors so based on these challenges that we faced in the first version uh, earlier this year we started testing a new version which we call hpn uh, which we call anonymous rate limiting version 2 and which alex will explain in detail so uh, as conrad said i'll uh, talk about our new anonymous rate limiting uh, system which is based on the rate anonymous attestation uh, he already mentioned some of the benefits but just as a quick review uh, this system has several benefits over the previous one uh, the first one is, is that now we don't need uh, we, we remove the need for trusted third parties uh, second there are less interactions between the client and the server because in the previous system we required uh, one blind signature per message so the client had to first get message blind signed then actually uh, send the message so there was two interactions and the third one is now that we can we can use uh, known solutions for network anonymity like Tor which in the previous system was a bit more complicated because of these custom third party proxies so what is actually direct anonymous attestation the direct anonymous, anonymous attestation is a cryptographic primitive which is implemented in processors that, that follow the trusted platform module standard as well as other chips which follow the Intel enhanced privacy ID specification. But rather than focusing on the hardware that runs this uh, cryptographic uh, protocol, we would rather like to focus on the cryptographic primitive itself. So uh, for our purposes, uh, direct anonymous att attestation has two key features. First, it allows for anonymous authentication. Uh, this means that you can prove that a trusted platform is signing a message but not which concrete platform is doing so. So in other words, uh, the signatures can prove membership of the device in a group but not 
which concrete device is signing the message. Uh, the second feature that uh, is important for us is the controlled linkability. So, given, sorry, for this controlled linkability, a device signs a message with respect to a base name string. Uh, in a way that two signatures from the same member are linkable if and only if they are done with respect to the same base name string. So, for example, if a device always signs a message with the same base name, then all the signatures will be linkable. So we will be able to link all his messages together. Uh, on the other extreme, if a device would randomize this base name and sign every message with respect to a different base name, then all the, all the messages would be completely unlinkable. So we'll see later that we can use these linkability properties to uh, achieve our rate limiting uh, needs. But before that, uh, we have to talk about the main four operations about, uh, that are involved in direct anonymous attestation because we'll need to refer to them later. Uh, the first one is called join and this is where a device gets credentials from an issuer. Typically a device is the client and the issuer is a server. And we can see this as the device becoming a member of the issuer group. Then once this device obtains credentials, it can sign messages with respect to this base name string in a way that uh, the linkability properties are uh, fulfilled. The linkability properties that we talked in the previous slide are fulfilled. So, then the verify operation essentially means that you can check whether a signature is valid for a given base message and um, base name. And finally the link operation is, uh, which is especially important for us, is it allows to check whether two signatures have been known by the same member and the same base name. Now since this signature linkability is essential for our purposes, uh, we actually need this link algorithm to be efficient. So, Let's take a look at how this uh, linkability looks in practice. To achieve this linkability, signatures contain a pseudonym which can be seen as a linkability tag. Uh, and this pseudonym is computed uh, as a one way function of the base name and the user private key. Uh, of course, the user private key is unknown to the server, so it is unknown both to the issuer and the verifier. The way this pseudonym works is like w if whenever, if you see two pseudonyms, uh, two equal pseudonyms, then it means for sure that the corresponding signatures were done by the same member and with respect to the same base name. So, this means that the link algorithm is efficient because the server just needs to store all the previously seen uh, pseudonyms and then whenever a new message comes, just extract its pseudonym and see if it, if it has already been seen before. Now that we have explained how direct anonymous attestation works, let's see how to use it actually in practice to achieve uh, the rate limiting, uh, our rate limiting uh, needs. So the idea is quite simple. It's basically enforce these base names to be computed in a very specific way so that uh, the concrete rate limiting rules for the system can be enforced. Um, so this means that the client will compute the base name according to these rules and will never send two messages with the same base name pseudonym because of course they, they could be detected very easily at the server side. Then the verifier which is a server will drop messages either if this base name has computed incorrectly according to the rules or if the pseudonym is repeated. So, uh, this would be the structure uh, to achieve our rate limiting uh, purposes. So it would, it looks like a tuple of co four components. The first one is a, a message type which uh, can be used to have different rules for different kind of messages. The second one is, is a time period which is actually a timestamp truncated to an hour or a day depending on, on the need. Uh, the second, the third one is a message digest which is an arbitrary function on the message and is used to introduce some message content into these rules. And the last is a count which is an integral between e one and n and is meant, is, can be seen as a multiplier. So given a fixed message type, time period message digest, then you can send up to n messages. 
So we found this base name structure to be expressive enough for our needs, but it doesn't mean that this is the only possible structure to uh, to do this kind of rate limiting. Now revisiting the previous example that Conark showed, the query logs, we could have a message that would look like this. First the search, the search query, in this case booking, uh, the landing URL and a timestamp. And we would like, we could like to enforce the following rule. We only want one message per user per hour per normalized search query uh, to be accepted by the server. To achieve this rule and following the previous base name structure, uh, the base name would look like this. First we will have the message type which is constant in this case, query log type. The second one would be a truncated uh, timestamp to the hour, so instead of 6.56 just 6. The third one, uh, normalized query. And the last one, just 1 in because in this case uh, that's the only option. So uh, essentially the strategy is to not let the user choose more than one base name uh, for a normalized search query and for a given hour. Another example that we might want to enforce is let's say we have a different kind of message we, which we only want to accept uh, three messages per user per day. So for this kind of message we, which we could call three daily type, the base names uh, would look like this. First the message type, uh, then the date, and then mm, the message uh, digest which in this case would be uh, empty because the rule is independent of the message content and then a count which in this case could be chosen between one and three. So a client at the start of the day uh, would like to, to send a message then it would see that it can choose out of three base names and it would choose one at random. It would mark this base name as used and then in the next message that, that would want to send it would pick from the two remaining base names etc. And essentially when it runs out of base names there is no way that the message quota is exceeded and there is no way that the, u the, the user can send an additional message without being detected at the server side. Now, if TPM was available like in all the devices, 100% of devices, we could basically end the talk here and say okay we leverage on the TPM uh, because it runs this direct anonymous attestation protocol and uh, we showed how to use it to rate limit. But in practice this is not the case. Um, first, TPM is not available in, the, in all the devices, like it might be available in this laptop but in general it's not. And then even if it's available, for example in our execution, execution environment, we want to run this rate limiting service in the client which is a browser extension. So. Uh, even if the TPM might be available physically in the device, we might not be able to access it. So, at the end, it's not realistic to assume that the TPM is available. So, what we did is we implemented the direct anonymous attestation protocol but without the TPM, so software only. Now, this opens uh, pos the, the possibility for a new uh, problem, which is basically okay. In the system we showed, we protect against a single user uh, from sending too many messages, right? So we kind of, okay, for a given user, this user has only a limited set of votes, let's say, to contribute in the system. But if we remove then the TPM, then it would, it could be quite easy for an attacker to create many identities and then obtain credentials for all of them and then essentially bypass the, the whole system. So, it, uh, note that this would not happen with a TPM because uh, if we would enforce the TPM then an attacker would need to actually get hold of many uh, TPM's devices which is not so easy. So, at the end if we cannot limit the number of credentials given to attackers then the whole system will be useless. Now this has a name, it's called civil attacks and we actually need to prevent them. So, the good thing is that we can pretty much focus on one operation of the system, which is the join operations. This is the operation where the clients get credentials, and the good thing is that it does not need to be anonymous. So, this is because, uh, according to, um, thanks to the protocol properties, uh, 
there is no way to link this join to any other of the user interactions with the server. So essentially, uh, the join is decoupled from all the other interactions. So since the joins do not need to be anonymized, then we can leverage uh, standard techniques, but just on this join operation. For example, a simpler one would be just to rate limit on the user IP. Uh, we believe that would uh, uh, already pro add some protection. Then depending on the use case of this red limiting system, uh, we, would, we might have email, user accounts, paid user accounts, subscriptions, so we might be able to use these for the join operations to, to give the credentials. Uh, now as an extra measure, we also rotate the issuer public keys. Uh, this means that every time the issuer public keys are rotated, all the credentials that the issuer has given are invalidated, so the clients need to join again. This is to avoid uh, an attacker to potentially accumulating many credentials over time and using them with any extra effort. Um, so, at the end, as a summary of this part, we believe there are ways to mitigate these civil attacks and that the rate limiting is useful even without TPMs. Okay, so as a summary for the key parts of our system, first we rate limit joins using all available information that we have, user IP, email if it's available, etc. Then rotate issuer keys periodically and last use the direct anonymous attestation linkability for doing the actual rate limiting on the messages. Now we have to mention some possible de-anonymization attacks that we might be able to do given that we control the servers, so given that we control both the issuer and the verifiers. Uh, the first attack would be uh, trying to make each user join a group where they are alone. So essentially, each user would join a group where, which is unique for them, uh, and then essentially this would, each signature, if this was the case, would contain like a user ID. So uh, this would pretty much uh, make it very easy for us to build user sessions. Um, this is quite easy to detect because the user fetch the issue, the issue of public keys periodically, and then the, user, the issuer would, sorry, the, the user would detect that the issuer is changing this issuer public keys when it should not, and then basically uh, could decide uh, to ban the issuer and not send any message anymore or to report it, or depending on the system. The second attack is a little bit more tricky, and we call it denial of join, is that the issuer has the power of m deciding who gives who it gives credentials to them. So in the in an extreme case, the issuer could only give credentials to a single user. And then since this since only this user would be able to send messages, uh, it would be trivial to track this user, right? So this is a, a bit more tricky to detect from the client side because uh, the clients would meet would need to cooperate with each other in order to know that a single part of the population is not receiving credentials and then react upon it, but in practice this is not so uh, easy to implement. But uh, in our concrete use case, since we have the incentive of keep uh, receiving data to run our services, um, we have more incentive on receiving data than on trying to uh, track users. And since to track users we have to drop messages uh, proportionally to the granularity that we want to track, it's not, uh, so it's not reasonable for us to, to try to do this attack. Okay, so we thought it would be a good idea to compare our system with similar systems that are used in production. Uh, one is called Privacy Pass and it's used in Cloudflare. And the way this works is basically a user solves a token, uh, sorry, so a user solves a captcha and then receives end tokens that can redeem later um, to avoid uh, solving more captures, right? So these tokens skip the, the, captcha, uh, the captcha puzzle, and these tokens can be redeemed anonymously. So uh, we couldn't use this, even though we could use this in some specific use cases uh, of our system, we cannot use it as a, as a general solution for our needs, because uh, the, well, the main reason that this, these tokens uh, can be redeemed at any point of time in the future and we cannot frame it to rate limit uh, at, spe at specific time periods as we require. Then the second one is called Anonize and is implemented in Brave, uh, Brave Browser. 
It essentially consists in the server being able to set up anonymous surveys for a subset of users uh, in a way that only one user can vote uh, once per, sorry, in a way that users can only vote once per survey. Uh, as far as I know, this is used for payments to decide the popularity of, of websites. Um, we couldn't find a way to use it directly to achieve our, our needs because, again, because uh, our trade limiting rules needed a little bit more of complexity. Like, you need, it, it needed uh, a time period, it needed uh, for some matches to, like the query logs to include part of the content to do the, the remit, so we couldn't find a way of using this. But uh, still, the systems are similar to, to our in some way. Um, so in, for the implementation part, uh, we implemented a pairing based cryptographic protocol which is used, uh, which is defined in a FIDO elliptic curve direct anonymous attestation. And since it uses pairing based cryptography, it's not so easy to find, or at least uh, the choices for libraries are, are a bit reduced. Uh, eventually, we decided to use a library called Apache, Apache Milagro, Milagro Crypto Library, which is in C. So we implemented the protocol in C using this library. And since our client runs in a web browser, we compiled it to WebAssembly uh, and built, uh, wrote bindings to JavaScript for that. And then for the server side, we used the same C implementation, but wrote, ni uh, wrote native bindings for Node.js uh, as our server. Now the benchmarks, uh, especially the most important operation is the server verify, because this actually uh, influences how many messages per second can the server uh, process. So right now it's uh, four milliseconds per CPU core, so this means we can process 250 messages per second per CPU core. Uh, even though this is not blazingly fast, uh, we believe that it's fast enough to be used uh, in practice to be used in production. So, uh, this system, uh, like not the whole system is uh, open source yet, like the server side is, is not open source, but the crypto implementation of the direct anonymous station it is, as well as the client part in this repository. So, thanks for listening.